Learning AWS is an essential skill for anyone who works in the cloud, but it can be overwhelming to get started. Today, I'm going to simplify things and walk you through 10 services that you should be aware of when getting started. Sid here with DevOps Directive, where it's my job to help you level up your DevOps and cloud infrastructure skills. Today, I'm going to take you on a guided tour of the core AWS services and walk through how you can use them to build web-based applications. Without further ado, let's get into it. So you want to learn AWS, you log into the console and immediately are overwhelmed by the 175 different services that they offer. After the initial shock starts to wear off, you start to look through the services, but it's just too much to comprehend and your head explodes. Don't worry, that's how I felt the first time that I logged in as well. Luckily, when getting started, we can ignore 90% of these services and just focus on the handful of core items. Rather than rattling off a bunch of them and describing what they do, we'll be walking through the 10 services that you should focus on, and we'll do so in the context of a general web application architecture shown here on the right. By the end of the video, you'll understand what all these different boxes do, as well as how they fit together. If you get to the end of the video and still some things aren't clear, feel free to ask any questions in the comments section. The first thing that we need to do in order to run our web application is to have a place to actually run the code. The term that cloud providers use for this is compute. While I've shown three different compute options in the architecture diagram, you would generally choose just one for a single application. So what exactly is compute? You can think of these compute options as renting a computer from Amazon that they store in one of their data centers. In the same way that you've likely run an application on your laptop, you can rent one of these systems and run your code there. The pricing is based on usage, so you only pay for the time that you use and there's a variety of different configurations to choose from. The first type of compute, and the easiest to understand, is called Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2. EC2 fits the analogy of renting a computer in the data center very well, with the caveat that most of these systems are actually virtual machines. That being said, for most of the use cases, this distinction is not very important. EC2 instances come in all sorts of configurations, ranging from a tiny T2 Nano which is one virtual CPU and half a gigabyte of memory, which costs about $4 per month, all the way up to a massive X1 32X large with 128 virtual CPUs and almost two terabytes of memory. This costs over $5,000 per month. If you're just getting started with AWS, make sure you choose one of the inexpensive T2 or T3 instance types to keep your costs down. The next type of compute is called AWS Lambda, which you may have heard referred to as serverless or serverless functions. The idea behind Lambda is that rather than managing the machine yourself, including the operating system, upgrades, configurations, etc., AWS will handle all of that for you and you just provide your code. Lambda supports a number of different runtimes, including Node.js, Python, Ruby, Java, Go, and .NET. This can be a good option if you don't want to have to set up the servers yourself, but it does require structuring your application a bit differently so you want to do some additional research before going this route. A third option that I'll highlight is called Amazon Fargate, which allows you to run your code within containers without having to manage the underlying machines. This falls somewhere in between the first two options, because containers allow for greater control of the underlying system, but AWS still manages the underlying servers. This might be a good option if you're already familiar with Docker and containers, but if you're just getting started, I recommend using EC2 until you have a solid foundation. Okay. Now that we have a place to run our application, we still need to configure the network to be able to connect to it. The necessary services to do this live in the networking and content delivery group. If you think about the modem and wireless router you likely have set up in your home network, AWS networking is kind of like that, but on a massive scale. They have 77 different availability zones spread across 24 different geographic regions all around the world. Using the following services, we can set up the necessary rules so that the servers our code is running on can talk to each other and receive traffic from the web. When working with AWS or the cloud in general, you'll often hear people talk about a virtual private cloud or VPC. While this sounds fancy, it's really just an isolated network. Creating other resources within AWS, you specify which VPC they should be associated with and connected to. When first getting started with AWS, a default VPC is automatically created and any other resources you provision will be automatically associated to that network. Down the road, when you're working on projects that require more control and security, you want to create custom VPCs, but the default one is fine for getting started. The next networking service that I'll call out is called Route 53. It's AWS's domain name system, or DNS system. 
it allows you to connect the domain to the IP address of the system you want to connect it to. This brings us to the next service, Elastic Load Balancing. If your application were running on a single EC2 instance, it would be possible to use Route 53 to map that domain directly to the IP address of the virtual machine. However, as applications scale, they often end up running across multiple machines. Elastic Load Balancing facilitates that, enabling you to route traffic across multiple targets to spread the load. These targets can be any of the compute types I called out, EC2, Lambda functions, or Fargate containers. One more AWS service to be aware of is CloudFront, which is a global content delivery network or CDN. Facilitates rapid delivery of large files such as images or video in an efficient manner around the world so that your application doesn't have to serve it itself. For simple applications with low traffic, this is unnecessary, but as the quantity of data that you're serving increases, this can be a game changer. Speaking of large files, we'll need some place to store those. The relevant services can be found in the storage group. If you think about the hard drive installed on your computer, multiply it by about 10 million, then install them in data centers around the world, set up replication to prevent data loss, you've effectively imagined Amazon's Simple Storage Service, or S3. You can store individual objects up to 5 terabytes each, and they promise 11 nines, that's 99.99999% protection against data loss. Within a web application, data such as images, audio, and video are often stored within S3. Pretty much anything that doesn't make sense to be stored in a database. This brings me to the final category of services that I'll cover today, databases. While it's entirely possible to manage and run your own database on one or more EC2 instances, AWS does offer a number of managed database services, which allow you to lean on their team of experts for setting up, backing up, and operating these. Databases are where you're going to store the majority of information required to run your web application. This includes data about your users, their settings, posts, comments, and any other features that your application supports. Under the hood, Amazon's running these databases on the same systems that you have access to via EC2, with the main difference being that you don't have to worry about managing backups and updates. If your application uses a relational database, the Relational Database Service, or RDS, is their relevant offering. It supports a number of underlying database engines, including Postgres, MySQL, and Microsoft SQL Server as well as a custom-built offering called Amazon Aurora, which AWS claims can give you 5x the performance of MySQL and three times the performance of Postgres. If document databases such as MongoDB are more your style, Amazon's DocumentDB might be the way to go. It's a fully managed database service that's compatible with the MongoDB ecosystem. Let's quickly review how all of these pieces fit together within the sample web application architecture that I drew out. First, we talked about where the application code will actually be run, either on an EC2 instance, a container running in Fargate, or as a Lambda function. Next up, we used Route 53 to configure our domain and pointed it to an application load balancer, which will allow us to run multiple instances of our application in parallel. Amazon CloudFront can serve as a cache to efficiently deliver large static content all around the world, and we used S3 to store and serve large files associated with the application. Finally, we stored application data within one of the managed database offerings, RDS for relational data, or Amazon DocumentDB for non-relational data. While everything we talked about today is specific to AWS, I'll point out that the other major cloud providers are not that different. Here I've recreated the same architecture diagram for both Google Cloud Platform on the left and Microsoft Azure on the right. And as you can see, all three of these clouds have very similar offerings. We've reached the end of our brief introduction to AWS. With a foundational knowledge of these 10 services, you can build just about any web application you can dream up. If you've learned something from this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to make sure not to miss out on future content. If you want to continue down the DevOps rabbit hole, make sure to check out one of those other videos over there. That's it for today, and remember, just keep building.